the advice I give myself is, man, get busy. And until I read To Kill a Mockingbird, I read when I was a little kid. I, I read picture books and, I, and comic books when I was in junior high and all that. And um, what I didn't know until I read To Kill a Mockingbird was that there was a lot of contemporary stuff out there that I would have loved. I just didn't, wasn't exposed to it. To Kill a Mockingbird was, had been out a year when I read it. It's, I mean, it's classic now. Harper Lee's gone. Um, but, but I felt this intimacy with the character, with Scout. And later when I look back and I, was, I, I, I understood, I realized that I was kind of modeling my narrative after Scout. I mean, she was basically, I'll tell you anything. I'll tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. And so there, th- that intimacy, uh, I thought, if, if I felt that intimacy with Scout, Harper Lee had to also feel that intimacy with Scout. You know, I mean, she was like, here I am, and I will tell you everything about this character. And given that, given that, that all, most, of the, most of the talk about To Kill a Mockingbird basically says, you know, Atticus was kind of like her dad, and I mean, it was her, it was her place growing up. And so she was, in, she was revealing a lot about herself. Read for pleasure. You know, read the stuff, read this. If you're a writer, read the stuff you like to write because that, I mean, the, the lessons are all in there. What did you learn to do to be successful in college? And what did you learn not to do? One thing I learned was um, when you're interested, go after it because that's probably going to be the, it's probably going to be the direction you go and you want it to be the direction you go if, if, if that's at all possible. You attended Eastern Washington State College, which is now Eastern Washington University, home of the... Well, it's the home of the Eagles now, but back then it was the home of the very politically incorrect savages. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I think, yeah. and, and, and the mascot was kind of this, uh, kind of like this cartoon, one-feathered Indian, yep. white man's idea of, a, of, a, of an Indian. <laughs> Well, you swim competitively. I did. Got a degree in psychology and sociology, which I also find those fascinating fields. In your college life, what did you learn to do to be successful in college? And what did you learn not to do? You know, we've got some seniors who in less than a year are graduating. Yeah. So what did you learn to be successful and what did you learn not to do? to be successful. Um, find out what you're interested in and go after it. It was like, I, I, we didn't have the designation in my day, but I was real ADHD. I had a real bouncy brain. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I realized, and I didn't even know that then, but one of the things, and I even researching it, I know that if that kind of brain, if you're not interested, you're just not going to pay. You know, you, I, I got really good at staring the teacher right in the eye while my mind was like headed down the road. But, uh, but the, other, the other part of that is that when you, when you run into something that's really intense, that you really are interested in, you get lost in it. And so, like I started, when I started taking psych classes and sociology classes, and I was coming from, you know, not only was Cascade, Idaho, a town of a thousand people, it was a town, it was an isolated town of a thousand people. We were 80 miles from the, ne- when I was in high school, we were 80 miles from the nearest movie theater. I mean, and, and back when I was a little kid, when we got, when we did have a movie theater, that's where we got the news. I mean, we get the, we get the news at the movie theater that, that, you know, the world could have ended on Wednesday and we wouldn't know until Friday night. And so, so there was, um, there was so much that I just didn't know. I mean, I, I believed everything I was told and I was living in a logging town and my education I mean, I was in school, but my education was coming from loggers and mill workers and things like that. So I get out in the, I get out to in, to school, and, and one thing I learned was, um, when you're interested, go after it, because that's probably going to be the, it's probably going to be the direction you go, and you want it to be the direction you go if if, if that's at all possible. Well, you went back, and you got your teaching certificate. After that, you taught at a few different primary and some secondary schools, and you also were a director of a, kind of a K through 12 alternative program. When you think back on your teaching career, do you have one student that comes to mind when you think about it as a whole? Is there one that just pops in your head, and, and why? 
Nate Hobby. <laughs> Nate Hobby was. I was in Oakland. I was in Oakland, California, mm -hmm. and and uh, and Nate was this guy. He he just was one of those guys that was. Um, he could look at. Um, he could look at almost any situation, particularly a physical situation, and figure it out. I was talking to him. I was talking to him one day, and he was showing me. I was working with him with his reading. I was the director by then, but he was he's just a really cool kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm talking with him and, and, and having him go over some reading stuff with me. And we came across the word cemetery, and Nate said graveyard. He paid cl so close attention to what something meant, but he couldn't, he, he was dyslexic. And so the, I mean, the, the letters were just coming up scrambled. Uh, one of the real early reading specialists, and I, so I set him, I set him up with her, and he didn't, he didn't graduate. He, I think, middle of his senior year, he, he, got to reading well enough that he could read road signs and all that kind of thing, and and mm -hmm. start went to a truck driving thing. But he came back. I guess, it, I guess it would have been right after, right after he would have graduated. He came back and he, um, he, he just wanted to say thanks. And he invited me to, to a barbecue with his family. I mean, an extended family. I mean, like a lot of people. And, and so I went to it. I drove over and he met me at the side of the park. It was a big barbecue thing they're doing in those big 55 gallon drum. And he brought me over there and I'm the only white guy in the place. And he just said, he walked in, he introduced me, he says, this is my uncle. I go back and I go back and I look at a guy like that and I think, this guy, I mean, I remember one day we were, we were sitting in the middle of the, of the lunchroom at the school and one of the guys was sitting on the back of a, a folding chair and the folding chair collapsed and he went down in and it caught his legs and no matter how anybody was trying to pull him out, it just tightened down and it was, the kid was screaming and all. Nate walk, looks at it and he walks over and he just steps behind him, puts his hands under here and just picks him straight up. Chair falls off. You think this kid has all kind of skills. He's smart as hell, but it doesn't get measured in school. Wow. And he's one of those guys that when he first came there, you say, you got to help me out, Nate. You're going to have to teach me how to, you're going to have to teach me how to teach you because if you don't make it, we both fail. He tell you how to teach you. Kick me out, but I'll, and but just let me come back. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. How about if how about if right before you get ticked off, I just let you leave the room and then you go. What a great story. That's yeah. that's I love that that was almost an immediate answer too. He's really that oh God, I snapshot. Love Absolutely. Do you still have contact with him? No, yeah, I don't. I have contact with some of those with some of those kids and I have a lot of contact with a lot of the old clients and things that I've had. But he's one I'd, I'd give anything to know where he is. Absolutely. Read. I want to dig into your books a little bit now. Um, okay. So I'm going to start here. Your first book, uh, Mr. Crutcher, was Running Loose, published in 1983. Your latest one is 2018 Loser's Bracket, which I love. Um, my personal favorite is 1990's The Crazy Horse Electric Game that I've read so many times. Are you ever done with a book? Do you, do you look back now and do you read it and see things like, oh, I would change this? Or are you content to let it be and live as a snapshot at that time? I, I'm normally, I'm normally um, willing to let it be in its time. And, and you know, when I'm talking with, if I'm talking with teachers or I'm talking with educators and things, you know, like if you look at the, if you look at the, at the gang situation in Crazy Horse Electric Game. The gang situation, that's, that's pretty much what it was when I was in that school in, in Oakland, Lakeside School. It's become a lot more sophisticated and a lot more dangerous. The only time I think I'd go back and change things is like when somebody comes along and they think they can turn it into a screenplay or something like that. You say, well, if you're going to turn it into a screenplay and you're going to put it in modern day stuff, you're going to have to change, you're going to have to change some dynamics. I can't think of a book that I would go back and make any major changes to. And I know that they become, you know, to some degree, they become historical fiction after a while because they're, you know, if you read Running Loose or Crazy Horse, or, you know, they have telephone booths and typewriters and things <laughs> like, you know, stuff you only see in a museum right now. But, I, but what, I, what I really like is when somebody reads it 
they get involved in it and everything, and then they can talk about the differences. When I was growing up in Cascade, Idaho, we had two TV channels when we finally got TV when I was like 12 and, yes. and black and white and, you know, the remote was a stick. I can't yeah. think of a major change that I, I'd make. And, and my editors have been really good about that. They, you know, I put some pretty rugged scenes in some of those books. And, yeah. and they, Do you have a good relationship me. with your editor? Do you have a good relationship or is it a love-hate no, it's, it's, I really do. I, I have a real good relationship. I, my, my original ed editor in, uh, in 83, kind of a legendary children's book. She did mostly picture books and things like that, but her husband was a, was a freelance editor for uh, Simon & Schuster. And so he did a lot of the editing of my older stuff, but she was also very good at that. And then when she left, she handpicked her, her successor, a woman named uh, Virginia Duncan, who is my editor now. Almost all of your books have had links to sports in them, uh, swimming, baseball, track, football. In what way does sports help you tell a story? For me, it's actually more about story than sport, but um, it helps a couple ways. One, one way it helps is familiarity. You know, it's, it's just mm. that's my teenage years that the stuff with sports was a big deal. You know, I mean, a, a sport is a good story. You got good guys and bad guys, depending on, you know, which side you're on. You got winners and losers. You got, I mean, you got a climax, you got characters, you got the whole thing. So there's a part, of, and you can make it exciting. The same, you can test yourself the same way psychologically as you do physically. And how far can I go? You know, how much can I take? You know, w w when is it a good idea and when is it stupid? There are times when I'm just, I'm, the story beat me. Yeah, I don't know where else to go with it, you know, I'm, and I've got to find that way. I've got to find the avenue through. I'm not going to write three quarters of a story and then junk it. You know, that's not going to happen. I'm going to figure out a way to get through it. And it's, it's painful in a different way, but it's painful. And, and there's a same sense of, uh, same sense of accomplishment, you know, when you finally finish whatever it is that you're working on. And I think that's true for, I think it's true for, for, home builders. I think it's true for mechanics. I mean, I think it's true for anybody who considers the thing that they're good at creating. Makes sense. Um, let's talk about your also career with therapy. Um, you, you still work, correct? As I'm, a not, I'm not working now, um, partly because, uh, well, <laughs> right now you yeah. can't, can't get out and do anything. But I, 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 when, I started, <clears throat> when I started writing and traveling so much, I, I couldn't do as much. So I, I did a lot of consulting, and I ran the child protection team as long as it ran, which was like 32 or 33 years. Um, but at this point, I'm mostly, if, if I do anything, it's consulting. Now, you've worked some with child abuse. you worked with a lot with child abuse. I was thinking this question, how some of our students – they've undoubtedly gone through some trauma in the last couple of months uh, due to just their psychology and uh, psych the psychology of COVID-19 and some are at home and we don't know what's been going on at home and social unrest and racial unrest. What therapist advice do you give to our students and teachers? First advice I'd give is, is, we're in uncharted territory. So the fact that you don't know what's happening next, we're all in the same boat. Teachers, students, everybody. This is, nobody alive has gone through this before. And so give yourself a break. You know, don't, don't put a lot of pressure on yourself to know more than anybody knows or know more than you should know because there is no should here. The other thing I would say is even though we can't, get together in, in ways that we used to, we can get together this way. And most of, most of us can get together on Zoom or FaceTime or, or things like that. So I think it's important to go ahead and, you know, find those people that you feel some, that you feel intimacy with and all that. Make sure that you get up to speed. A scary thing about this whole thing is that if you live in an abusive household, it can, like, it can easily become more abusive because, number one, nobody has eyes on it. And you're always together all the time. So whatever survival skills you've learned to stay away from the, from the struggle, you can still get help. You can, they're, they're, you know, go online. You can find places to go for help if you need help. Don't just endure it. 
And if you're on the other side of that, if you're one of those people with a really bad temper and you're an adult, you're a, one of those people with a really bad temper, you know you're doing damage, get, do the same thing. Get some help. Go on, go on. You can get therapy online. There are all kinds of, there are all kinds of kind of help places that you can go. One of the things about a time like this is you got to get smart. The more we know, the better chance we have of getting past it. The, the line that I think is even more important now than, than it is normally is, this too will pass. <clears throat> I, I need to, I know this is going to, you know, we will get a vaccine. We will be going back to school. We will be having regular life again. There was a, pandem- a pandemic like this back in 1918. And we have a lot more medical stuff now than we did then. So it will pass. Write down what the danger parts are in your life. The places that are going to make you depressed, the places that are going to make you rageful, those things, so that you know how to avoid them. Because now's the time to just do it the best way you know how to do it. You know, in your imagination, I think any, for any one of us, our imaginations are the things that save us here. Read a lot and have some fun. Don't, you know, the pressure, everybody's going, what if you get behind in school? Everybody's going to get behind in school. Oh, if, yeah. everybody, if everybody gets behind, you're not behind. <laughs> that's true I love that well, I, I thought I would dig into a little bit I know you get asked this a ton but I had to go there uh, about censorship several of your books being challenged or attempted to be outright banned from libraries does the fight against censorship ever get old or are you still raring to go to fight for your right to, to write about what you need to or what you want to it never gets old. Um, I never feel like I'm fighting for my right to do it because I just feel like I have the right to do it. <laughs> and the reason for that is, I mean, I grew up, like I said, my dad was a bomber pilot. He was a patriot. And he was considered himself real conservative. And if you were running back in the day in the 50s and 60s, 70s, if you were running for any office between dog catcher and president of the United States in Valley County, Idaho, my dad was your, was your campaign person. And he would have run a nail through his eye before he let a book get banned. He thought he fought a war for that. So, I, and then I, along with that, I grew up in the, you know, I was in high school and college in the 60s, which is hippie time. And the whole idea of, of banning a book was just, you didn't do that. So when it started coming back kind of in the 80s, um, I was already hardwired to say, I can write whatever I want. What I always feel like I'm fighting for is a student's right to read. And I'm fighting, I feel like I'm fighting for a student's right, well, uh, uh, not just their right, but I'm fighting for a recognition of the fact that, that we, are, we are smart enough to know what books we want to censor for ourselves. The only censor for any, any one of us is us. If I've written a book that offends you, close it. The minute you, you don't want to read a book, that close it, go get a book you like. You know, you, that, you're the person who should be able to censor me for you. So the fight for me is, number one, the fact that, that you know, middle school and high school kids, they know themselves. That, you know, you're the PhD of your own life. You know yourself better than anybody, and you know what you can handle and what you can't. We're supposedly rearing our, bringing up our families, bringing up our kids to live in a country where we don't have censorship where, where, you, where you get as many ideas and you get to decide for yourself what's true and what isn't. That's, you know, that's what the First Amendment is really all about. It's not about somebody out there being really smart and telling you what's good and what's bad. As a person who's against censorship, that doesn't mean I think all books are good. I mean, I think there are books that are trash. And if anybody asks me, I say so. But I can't tell you not to read them because you, you, they might be, it might be your gold and my trash. If you're a parent and you want all these books banned and things like that, and you don't want your kid to read it, and you don't want anybody else's kid to read it, all that, you're setting yourself up with a fight with your own kids and with the kids with the next generation. Because I mean, you tell me I can't read a book, I'm going to figure out a way to read the book. You know, that's that's human, and it's certainly it's certainly teenager, but it's also human. All I'm I'm 74, and I still feel that way. So the fight for me is a lot about it, it, it is a lot about Let's sit down and talk about the reason that you're afraid for your kid to read this book or that you're afraid for all kids to read this book. If we start talking about those reasons, then it becomes a little clearer that, you know, there are a lot of, you know, that, that the real, only real censors are the people that have their hands on the book. 
I used to tell I used to tell parents when they when they were banning a book for their kids. I said that's I said that's great, but I said you're gonna this back when I was a therapist. And part of what I would say is, you know, you can either spend twelve and a half dollars for that book now and let them go ahead and read it, or you can pay one hundred and fifty bucks an hour every once a week for your kid to have therapy <laughs> because you guys are, you know, because you guys are at war. <laughs> that is true. Wow. It can, you can come down to money. I totally agree. And the other part is if you read the book with your kid, you can tell them you, why you hate it. You can tell them why the, why that Chris Crutcher's ideas are trash. Here's a chance for me. Here's a chance for me to talk to my kid in a way that I don't miss, you know, don't normally get a chance to do that. Absolutely. In your book, Staying Fat for Sarah Burns, you have a character named Moby that says, ain't it a trip where heroes come from? Who are your current heroes or have your personal heroes changed throughout your life? They, they've changed. Um, one of the things that, I, that happened when I started working as a therapist, well, when I worked in the alternative school first, and then working as a therapist was it changed my idea of what a hero is. And when I was, I was growing up, and, and I actually used this line, I used to, you know, Superman was my hero. And then by the time I got a little older, I thought, Superman's not a hero. He, he's bulletproof. You, know, you can't <laughs> hurt him. You know, you don't have kryptonite. You don't have a chance. And even with kryptonite, he always figures out a way. People who can be hurt, you know, people who stand up with a big risk, people who are able to stand up under huge embarrassment for the shame they feel for things they've done to their kids or to each other or whatever and and find a way to write themselves i don't know that there are any heroes really but they're heroic acts i was in high school when when uh, cassius clay at the time when the were when the heavyweight championship i realized that he was um he was fighting sonny liston who was also black but was a like a a true thug. I mean, he, he'd been in prison. And all of the people that I knew wanted the prisoner, the, the thug, to beat, all, be, beat Clay because he had a big mouth, because he was a black man who was willing to stand up and talk. And then he turns into Muhammad Ali. Oh. And I mean, I think this guy's got serious, serious courage. Because I mean, he's at the top of his game. He's in early on, and he's willing to risk it all to say, I didn't necessarily believe what he believed in. I thought, whoa, a guy stands up like that. And he was, he was my guy I, way back then. My heroes were always a little bit different. I mean, I, I, you, you can't argue that Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't one of the most courageous guys that ever lived. But if I'm going to talk, um, talk about a guy who's going to go the distance, I'm, I'm going to go with Malcolm X. Because Malcolm X is a guy who's, I mean, he was a pimp. He was in prison, and he comes out, and he's black Muslim, separatist, and all that, goes to Mecca and sees every color of human being in the world and going, uh-oh, and he starts coming back from a different direction under a lot more hate, and had he not been killed, uh, would have been a pretty amazing character. Those, those, are the, those are the guys that, you know, that I tend to look for. I had a friend... He was Japanese. He, he, I grew up with him. We were buddies in high school. We were college roommates. His father was fighting in this cracked um, Japanese outfit that fought only in Germany during World War II, being treated like crap because he was Japanese and we were fighting the Japanese. While his, while his mom, this Nobi's wife, my friend's mother, was in a concentration camp here in the United States. She's an American citizen. Never set foot in Japan. She's in a concentration camp in he's fighting. Well, I would just like to say to Black and High students right now, speaking of heroes, here's this almost 40-year-old 40, 40 guy who came from a little bitty small town from Jasper, Tennessee, who now somehow in the twists and turns of life gets to talk to his hero, and one of them right here. And so your dreams do come true and things like this happen. So, sir, you, you are one of my heroes. And oh, hero. thank you. I appreciate that. that. Um, you didn't start your writing career until you were 35. So what is something about being a writer that would surprise people to learn? 
I, I, the thing, I think the thing that would surprise people is how your imagination gets to do things that it couldn't do necessarily in real life, right? In other words, I, I might create uh, an athlete that played the same sports I played only they're really good, <laughs> you know, and you can get the sense of I'm feeling really good. You can you get so lost in a story sometimes for fiction writers. You get so lost in a story that th- your characters become real. And for I mean, you, it takes you a year, maybe a year and a half, to write a book. And by I'm, I mean, you are you are as enmeshed with those characters probably, maybe well even more enmeshed than you are with the people in your in your real life. And when I was working as a therapist, it was kind of a toss-up because you're working 10 hours a day with some really strange problems. But a lot of those problems, at least, were working their way into the fiction. The other thing is being a writer of any kind, fiction or nonfiction, helps you understand what you think and why you think it. Because when you write, you write what you're going to write and you just put it down first. And then you go back and you fix it. And you start looking for the perfect language to say what it is you want to say. And the more, the more detailed you get with that language, the more accurate you become with, you know, with your thinking and you have to go back into your thing, you get smarter and you get, you get smarter about your own personal thinking style and your own, what's rational and what's emotional. I mean, you get, you get a whole bunch of that. So I think, what I, what I walked away with is I thought, after I'd written a few books, I thought, God, I understand myself a lot better than I, than I would. Because if I, want to make a, if I want one of my characters to make a point, it's got to be a good point, And it's got to fit that character. I get to look at the world through the eyes that aren't mine. Even though I created the character, I'm looking, th- I'm looking at the world through eyes that are somebody else's. Thing I was working in a project not too long ago where... It, it was called the Mother Project, but it could work for almost anybody, where, where people were being asked to tell, a, tell any story, true story, about their mother through their mother's eyes. Oh, I'll tell you what, I did it, and it will knock you over, guaranteed. Especially if you write something where you're, like, really ticked off at your mom or something, you, you know, that, and all of a sudden you have to go back and say, okay, I'm, I can't, I can't, when I write this story, I can't say what's wrong with it. I have to say, this is, this is my, I'm telling the story in her voice. It will. Oh. Now you can do that about your best friend. You can do it about your dad. You can do it. I mean, and you walk away with, oh, you know, maybe I was locked into my position. That's amazing. Too much. The last one, I have a couple of rapid fire fun questions. So they're, they're not heavy at all. Here we go. You won an American Library Association Lifetime Achievement Award. Where do you keep it? Actually, I have uh, I have three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and actually, there there I keep one. One is well, I, I I got two of them that I like. I have two um, intellectual freedom awards. Yes. So they're like because I got banned. So I like I keep those on my wall. The actual one I think you're talking about, the ALA. God, what's the, what was her name? <laughs> Margaret. Uh, Margaret Edwards Award. Yes. When I first got it, I I kept thinking it was the Margaret Thatcher Award, and then <laughs> <laughs> ALA people got mad at me. So I have yeah. those. They are the only ones I have. They're the only ones I have up. But uh, and so they're actually you can. There we go. Right. They're right. Here they are on the wall. Yeah, on the wall. Glorious, but those are the those are the, i you, you know you're around long enough you get a lot of awards, but those are the ones that I keep reminding myself that I actually did write some books. Why you do what you do? Yeah. What's your favorite sports movie? Hoosiers is up there. Mm. Um, Friday Night Lights, the movie and the series. Yes. Because I had number one, I'd read the book and I met Buzz Bissinger. He and I, 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 we did a thing together one time, and he had, um, he had his 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 athlete, the um, Booby Miles. Yes, rhythm. I got to spend like forty five minutes talking to Booby Miles, a kid that had been he was going to be a pro and then he got hurt and yeah. he, he just got dumped. So because of that, is Friday Night Lights probably absolutely. It's a masterwork of a book too. It tri- yeah. 
And part of it was having met having met Bissinger and talking to Booby Miles, I was filling in some blanks because I could see the difference between the movie and the book. Yes. But, um, yeah, I, I, I did really enjoy it. And I, and I loved the series. What's the most boring thing about you? My bouncing brain. You'll ask me a question. <laughs> You'll ask me a question. I'll start it on the answer. And by the time I'm finished, I'm talking about something you didn't even care about. <laughs> and it won't even occur to me until I have a dream about it. Yes. <laughs> what was your um, favorite non-writing job and your least favorite non-writing job? My most favorite non-writing job... I really loved the dropout school, the, the, the alternative school, but probably my, my best, best job was when I was, when I was in college, I used, I used to drive um, mail and freight back into the primitive area in Idaho, single lane dirt logging roads with logging trucks on the road, but way back into the Idaho, up the salmon, the South Fork of the Salmon River, way back into this little town called Yellow Pine, which had like, 45 people in it in the winter time and maybe a few more like that in the summer. But like you were the town hero, the minute you came in, I mean, you were bringing beer, you were bringing whiskey, you were bringing food and you were bringing the mail. <laughs> the people who in the winter time, I mean, they came, if you got, if you got sick in the winter time, you came out on a snow cat. Oh, wow. So yeah, I, I, I love that job. That's good. And you just stop down on the South Fork of the Salmon River in the fall and you see the salmon, spawning coming back up to you know, beat to hell you know coming beautiful. all the way back from the ocean that's beautiful when you think of high school when you're in high school what music pops in your head first this is embarrassing but beach boys yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, okay what about i know it was a little limited on movies but when you think of high school and you think of a movie which one pops in your head first like I said, when I was in high school, we had to go a long ways to get to them. <laughs> yeah. uh, God, you know what? I think it was the Pink Panther. I, it was oh. the Peter Sellers. It, it was some of the, I, I watched that stuff and I love more than anything else, more than all the serious stuff and everything that I love is comedy. Yes. And this was just, this was wonderfully funny, crazy, zany. Yeah, absolutely. Comedy. Peter Sellers was, yeah. What are you currently reading if you are reading something? Oh boy, I, you know, I just finished a book called The Nickel Boys, oh. and it's, 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 a, it's a fiction book, but it's based on a real um, juvenile detention thing in Florida, and it's kids that got thrown into ju juvenile detention in like 40s, 50s, 60s, and so it's racially s split, white guys in one part, black guys in the other part, written, written about the black characters and it is unbelievably brutal and unbelievably heroic it's one of those books that you people say you know i couldn't put it down you have to put it down and oh. then you have to pick it back up and I, I i believe it just won the Pulitzer prize it's it's stunning i started reading a non-fiction book called empire of the summer moon and it's basically, it's a story, it's a historical thing about uh, the Comanche Nation holding over 200 years worth of the Southwest and part of Mexico from, I mean, they beat the Spanish, they beat the Mexicans, they beat the Americans over and over and over again before they were taken. And it, they were brutal. They were, un, they were, they did things <laughs> that, uh, it's that, it's that unvarnished, it's told by a Pulitzer Prize winning historian and uh, it reads like fiction. Absolutely. Two more. What do you know for sure? I know there's always a reason to keep going. There's always a reason to keep going. You got to stay alive. That's good. As President Jed Bartlett would say, because I love the West Wing, um, what's next? A kind of a funny book about a kid who, on the, on the basis of some... Um, of some writing that he's turned into his teacher and then gets, he gets uh, invited to this really elite summer writing camp. So he's going there with a bunch of, you know, all over the country kids come to this really elite writing camp in Vermont. Only he didn't write the, he didn't write the essays. He's not a writer. He cheated. His girlfriend wrote the essays. So he's going to a camp where everybody wants to be a writer and it's the last thing in the world he wants to be. 
<laughs> but I'm I'm working on another I'm working on another thing with my my partner of thirty some years. She's a she's a play therapist and worked with tra- traumatized eight and unders kids, yeah. but mostly six and unders. There's thirty, probably thirty five years of stories of the world through the world through those kids' eyes living in the eye of the hurricane, just living in the eye of sexual abuse, living in the eye of, of, of physical abuse, of neglect that's so dangerous that you could die. Um, and, and it's based on those, the utterances, those kids' utterances and their play in therapy. It, it's going to have to go to probably to a different publisher because it's, it's way more than just young adult. It really gives you, it gives you a, in my mind, a, a picture of the human condition and what it looks like at the source. You know, it's like we see kids in high school and, or, or, with, or junior high or whatever with behavior that just is not acceptable. Except if we knew the story behind that behavior, the survival story behind that behavior, if we knew how it started, we would treat it differently. So this is, this is kind of... The, the rugged world from the source. I mean, there's some four-year-old utterances in here that just knock you over. Four years old. Wow. Four years old. You know, kids, kids, kids that would do anything to get back to a family that's, they would never survive. But they're, they're so connected to it. That's my mom. I don't care if she's a drug addict. I don't care if she doesn't take care of me. She's my mom. I want to get back. Wow. And it gives you, there's a real sense of the, the almost biological, I mean, absolutely uh, primitive connection within family. And it, it, it just makes, a, it makes us look at, I think, it, what it does to me when I'm writing it, and I knew some of these kids, um, it makes me, it, it, it always makes me think differently about how we treat so-called bad behavior. Absolutely. That's all the questions I've got. I've hopefully not worn you out too bad today. Um, hey, I'm not, I'm not doing much. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for, the, for talking to the students here at Blackman High School. And, and uh, I'll get this video out soon. And it really means a lot to this school right now.